In this three steps to sketch, we're going to graph a shifted cosecant graph. Y equals one half cosecant of X minus pi over two plus one. A quick note, we can tell that this is a shifted cosecant graph because in with the X, we see this minus pi over two. So we're going to have a shift to the right. We'll talk more about that when we get into the method. And the plus one, that's a vertical shift up. So these are the keys for us to know we should use our shifted cosecant method. So now let's do a quick overview of the method and then we'll get started with our graph. All right, so here's our template. This will help you stay organized. In step one, you find the companion equation and then you'll find its essential information. So this method really does take advantage of your knowledge of the companion functions that I like to call them. They're just the reciprocal functions. So the companion for a cosecant graph is a sine graph. And it's likely that you already know how to graph that. And so we'll build off of that knowledge to graph the cosecant graph that we want. All right, in step two, we'll plot our companion pattern. So that'll be our sine pattern and we'll take care of the shifts. And then we'll do a quick transition in step three. We'll create the reciprocal graph, sketch it in and then repeat. And that's all there is to it. Step one is really where you get a lot of the information. That good organization is key. All right, so let's go ahead and start. Let's write out the general form for shifted cosecant equations. It's y equals a cosecant of bx minus c plus d. Okay, and this is gonna help us as we analyze and identify different pieces of information. Um, I always like to do a quick check at the beginning. You see the bx minus c is the input of the cosecant function. I like to make sure that my input for the function that we're trying to graph has a minus sign. If you have a plus sign, that's no big deal. You just have to remember that that's minus a negative value, which is going to indicate a left shift for your horizontal or phase shift. Okay, but we have the minus. I think we're good to jump in. Let's write our companion equation. So we're going to build off a sine function. All you do is replace cosecant with sine. So y equals one half of sine x minus pi over two plus one. So we're gonna analyze this. For our base graph, this will help us get our companion pattern. A, of course, is the leading coefficient right in front of the function sine, that's one half. Okay, that'll help us set our max and min for that companion pattern. All right, B, you see, is the coefficient of x and there's nothing there, so that's an understood one. Okay, that tells us that one cycle should happen between zero and two pi. And we also use it to find the period. You calculate that, two pi over b. So two pi over one, our period, or the length of one horizontal cycle is two pi. All right, to label our axes, you can choose any scale you want, but I think you can be very intentional, especially with your horizontal scale, so that your points in the companion pattern step next will nicely align with your horizontal tick marks. And to get this to happen, take your period and divide by four for your horizontal axis scale. So two pi over four is going to be pi over two. And then for your vertical scale, one will usually work really well. Looking at one half, I think that'll be perfect. So look at that A value just to do a double check. All right, let's go ahead and label our axes now. So starting with our horizontal axis, we count by one pi over two. So one pi over two, two pi over two reduces to pi, three pi over two, 4 pi over 2 reduces to 2 pi. All right, and now we'll go in the other direction, but this time we'll be using our negative values. Easy enough. All right, and then on our vertical axis, we just count by 1. So it's nice to just go ahead and have this grid labeled. All right, now that we have that taken care of, let's identify our shifts. So remember C over B is going to be your phase shift. That's another name for a horizontal shift. And D is your vertical shift. So look at that general formula again, if you need to, we already talked about BX minus C and the importance of just noting what sign your C term should have. So our C is going to be pi over two and B is going to be one. So C over B must just be pi over two. And so that tells us we should have a phase shift of positive pi over two, or if you wanna write out that that's a right direction shift, I think that can be really helpful. All right, and then D is that last part of the equation, that plus one. Okay, so we know we're going to move up one unit. And we'll take care of that again in step two. 
All right, the last piece of analysis is to find the asymptotes equation for our cosecant function. So um, we're back looking up here at our original equation, and there's a really easy way to do this. I'm gonna do a rather quick explanation of this now, but if you're interested in knowing more details about this sort of tip for finding the asymptotes equation, check out the link that I'll post in the video description for the cosecant playlist, and you'll find a couple of videos that go into a lot more detail just on finding the asymptotes. All right, so all you have to do is take the inputs of your cosecant function, so that's this part, that bx minus c, or in our case, x minus pi over two. So we'll do just a little scratch work here. Take those inputs and set them equal to the asymptotes from the parent cosecant equation. So it's just y equals cosecant x. And we represent those asymptotes as zero plus pi k, where k is an integer. So you set these two things equal and then simply solve for x. So nothing too difficult here, add pi over two to both sides. I'm going to write the final asymptotes equation in our blank. X equals the zero and then the plus pi over two. I'm just showing that real quick, plus pi over two. Those are the only like terms on the right side. Pi k is its own type of term. So we end up with an asymptotes equation that's x equals pi over two plus pi k. I like finding the asymptotes equation at the beginning because when you have your final graph after step three is complete, you can sort of double check yourself. Um, and so go ahead and just mentally substitute in a few integers for k. I like to sub in k is zero. That's really easy. We see we should have an asymptote at x equals pi over two. Um, substitute in k is one if your graph extended that far. And I think ours should we should have another asymptote, yep, at x equals three pi over two. Let k equal negative one, you should have another at negative pi over two. So we're just expecting those for our final graph after we complete step three. Okay, all of our analysis is done. We've put in the work, we're ready to actually get this graph on our page. So in step two, we're going to plot our companion pattern, that's our sine graph, and we're going to go ahead and shift it. So do this lightly or in a a separate color from your final graph. I'm going to show this in light blue. And recall that the base sign pattern is going to be starting at the origin with a zero or an x-intercept, maximum, zero, minimum. Okay, so let's graph that part. We'll take care of the shifts in a moment. So lightly or in a different color, start with your x-intercept at the origin. Our first point, our maximum, or I guess this is our second point, will happen at the first horizontal tick mark and the y value of this point will just be whatever a is, so 1 half, so that'll be right here. Okay, then our next x-intercept, our next point, will happen at the next horizontal tick mark to the right, and our final point in the companion pattern will happen at the third horizontal tick mark to the right, so at 3 pi over 2, and the y-coordinate value for this time will just be the opposite of a, so this is our minimum for the companion pattern. All right, so you can kind of see that sine curve forming there. And now we can shift. So we'll shift each of these points um, and we're going to take care of the shifts together. So we can move right pi over two and up one. And I'll mark these new points with X's this time, still in light blue, so still marking this lightly. All right, so we move right one horizontal unit, that's pi over two and up one. Okay, that's our origin point originally. So just move each point right pi over two, up one, right pi over two, up one, right pi over two, up one. Okay, so again, you can see this little sine function. If you were graphing what we wrote in our companion equation, you would be done. And again, this is why I like this method because it's probable that you already know how to graph shifted sine graphs. All right. Now we're ready for step three. Let's transfer this into the reciprocal. So each of the original x-intercepts so this is before shift, the first and the third point, if you will, those will turn into vertical asymptotes because, again, thinking back to what they were originally, they were zeros, their value or their y was zero. And if you try to take the reciprocal of that, you end up with something undefined. You can't do one divided by zero. So take each of those original x-intercepts, those will be our vertical asymptotes. Okay, and then what's the maximum from the companion sign pattern? put a point there, that will become your local or relative minimum. And I'm going to go ahead and sketch in this part of the cosecant curve. 
Okay, and then what was the minimum from the companion sine graph? Put a point there. That will be your local or relative maximum. So here's the rest of our cosecant curve, and this is one cycle of our equation. Now we can go ahead and repeat. Of course, we've kind of run out of room to the right, so let's just work in the negative direction. So all you have to do is repeat this pattern over and over again. So working backward, here's this point that's going to be our local or relative maximum. We have an asymptote here at negative pi over 2. We'll have our local minimum and the curve sketching it in. Another asymptote and a final local maximum. So you can see we have two and a half cycles here. Hopefully as we were graphing, you were noticing that the asymptotes were falling where we predicted when we talked about this asymptotes equation here. Um, so just as a reminder, look at this one at pi over two, that's when k equals zero, and the one at three pi over two when k is one. It'd be a great exercise if you're still getting comfortable with this uh, asymptotes equation and k. Practice substituting in a few more values of k, plug it into an online calculator even, um, if you are wanting to see what this graph looks like even more, um, even further down the grid. Okay, and this was k equals negative 1. Hopefully you would predict this asymptote at negative 3 pi over 2 is when k is negative 2. Um, so that's just kind of a cool thing to look at. Again, I like that as a double check. Another great double check is to look back at this term b. We said b tells us how many cycles of our graph should happen between 0 and 2 pi. We said one full cycle. And so you can see it's kind of a broken up cycle, but this part right here between 0 and 2 pi is definitely one full cycle of our cosecant graph. So that's a neat thing to check. We should feel really confident in this graph. And hopefully after working this example through using the three steps to sketch method, you feel really confident that you can apply this to any other shifted cosecant graph. Um, feel free to check out the link in the video description if you're looking for more examples of cosecant graphs, and I'll also post some for graphing all the other trig functions. Thanks so much for watching.